Hello and welcome to the Friday, June 16th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I am recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Now we certainly know that hacking a lot of wireless access points isn't all that difficult. Often it just takes a weak admin password or a simple web remote code execution vulnerability. Given that there is a lot of interest from hackers in these access points, it's no surprise that more advanced hackers like the CIA are interested in them as well. So in its latest release, WikiLeaks did release documents about a project called Cherry Blossom. This is part of the larger CIA leak from which WikiLeaks has been releasing for a while. Essentially what this is a framework to install custom firmware on a variety of different routers. Now, these documents call a manipulated router a flytrap, and a flytrap is then able to, for example, record email addresses, MAC addresses, voice over IP numbers, and well, all the other things that you typically can do if you are flashing firmware on a wireless router. Now, quickly scanning the documents, I didn't really see any fundamentally new exploit here. Uh, these are all pretty much well-known techniques that you do find in many other hacker tools that are publicly available. And well, here we go yet again, more vulnerabilities in DVRs. Pentest Partners released a report with a set of easily exploitable vulnerability in more Xiaomi DVRs. Xiaomi is a manufacturing China that makes DVRs for a couple dozen different brands and their particular DVR boards were one of the main victims of Mirai. So very likely that these systems are still out there for these new vulnerability. There is no patch available at this point. Part of it is yet another Telnet server. If it's not listening on port 23, it may actually be listening on port 12,323 or on port 9,527. The admin passwords again are simple, either plank or one, two, three, four, five, six. Same thing we have seen for Mirai. In addition, there are buffer overflows in the web interface and then daily changing sudo passwords. So once an attacker has local access to the system, they could could use these passwords to then become a root. The idea of daily changing passwords doesn't really sound that bad, but if you think about it, if it's the same passwords for all devices, then of course all it takes is one leak, like in this case, and these passwords are known. In the last few months, Microsoft has released a number of critical updates for its Windows Defender engine. That's the library, the engine behind a lot of the Windows anti-malware tools. Now, it doesn't look like they patched all flaws. James Lee at Serocon did release more details about additional flaws found in Windows Defender. These flaws can lead to remote code execution once Windows Defender scans a malicious file. In the past, Microsoft was rather quick in releasing updates for problems like this. You typically do not have to apply these updates, but uh, they're being downloaded and applied as part of a regular, usually daily signature updates. But well, uh, luckily the bad guys sometimes make mistakes uh, too and that's how Kaspersky was now able to create a decryption tool for the JAF crypto ransomware. So if you're affected by this particular ransomware, then you'll be able to decrypt your files using this tool. Kaspersky added it to its Arachne decryptor and you can download it from noransom.kaspersky.com. 
So today again, uh, we have uh, one of our STI students here uh, to talk about uh, his recent research project. I have with me here, Preston Ackerman. And uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Preston? Sure, uh, Dr. Ulrich, my name is Preston Ackerman, as you mentioned. Uh, I've been in, in the STI program for about a year and a half. I'm about halfway through. Uh, I work in law enforcement. I chose to do the um, MSISE versus the management one, although I am presently in management, I felt that the uh, MSISE was a good balance of both leadership and uh, technical skills. So I've really enjoyed the program so so far and look forward to visiting with you today. Yeah, thanks. And now your paper was about a topic that uh, I always advocate, and uh, that's a two-factor authentication. Now, uh, two-factor authentication enterprises, I think, is pretty much a standard now. But uh, one big problem is sort of you know, home users, small businesses, and that's something you're focusing on. I, for example, see a lot of attacks against realtors or so against cloud storage or cloud-based email services that rely on phishing and you know, two-factor authentication helps there. Uh, what are some of the issues that you found that prevent people from implementing two-factor authentication? Well, one big one is obviously a lack of awareness. But the study I uh, worked on actually uh, started by giving the users awareness, you know, to sort of take that off of the table and chose to focus on when people are aware of it and know it's there and understand the threats but still choose not to do it, you know, why not? Why aren't users enabling these security mechanisms that are really universally advocated by security professionals, you know, institutes like SANS or government agencies, you know, nearly anybody would agree that two-factor authentication is a good idea, and yet adoption rates are very, very low. Uh, so the study um, focused on millennials and specifically started by showing the users a video stating, you know, why two-factor is a good idea. Um, you know, the kind of starting by demonstrating the crime problems, you know, why, uh, why they need to enable it, then, dem you know, explaining what it is and demonstrating how easy it is to use to include actually setting up for them in real time two-factor authentication on a Google account. Uh, then, one, you know, so that took about 90 seconds is all to show them how to do that then it walked through using it once you have set it up, just a, a simple login into the account with two-factor enabled. So the idea was to kind of enable users to see that, yes, I, I can do this, I should do this, why not do this? And then it revisited those same users a week later to see who had, in fact, enabled two-factor. And the study was, I, I had partnered with a uh, an individual who's uh, a PhD at a university uh, in the region that I work in and you know the the questions all were very uh, rooted in kind of behavioral psychology you know I don't have a, a specialty in that but uh, he had a good understanding of that so um, you know in the first survey they were asked you know do you plan to use it are you comfortable using it um, do you think it's easy or hard uh, do you agree that there's a threat, you know, it, it asks all these types of questions. And then in the second study, it kind of asks those again, only it's, uh, and that's like a week later. Uh, so did you enable two-factor authentication and why or why not to kind of understand those reasons? So what we found, of course, the most common is always going to be, I didn't have time, e even though it was demonstrated that probably, you know, just about everybody does have some amount of time to to do something that's that's so easy, but uh, out of the additional factors, you know, one that what, that was the one I think was a key finding was um, users who are just not confident in their ability to do it will not do it, even even when they kind of they wanted to, they maybe said even that they expected that they would do it, but when you come back a week later. And they said, well, I just didn't quite understand how it works, or um, I was not confident that it would be easy for me to use. Those users would, uh, tip, would often not enable it. 
So user self-efficacy wound up being something that's very, very important. Do you think a standardization can help there? You, know, you mentioned Google, and of course, I think Google Authenticator has become somewhat a standard. So uh, if more sites would really gravitate to Google Authenticator, people would be more confident in using it because they start using it one site and then they uh, sort of use it for other sites as well? I certainly do think that would help. You know, one thing I also pointed out in the paper is um, maybe sor sort of more of an opt-out uh, architecture of that choice when users open their accounts rather than opt-in would help. And you, we do kind of start to see a little bit of that with, with some in implementations, especially uh, perhaps in the financial industry. Um, you know, if you go sign in from a computer you haven't signed in bef from before, you might be asked to go provide another uh, factor. So um, I think that would be very beneficial is if the providers would get a little bit more serious about um, not quite forcing, but certainly encouraging uh, more strongly users to, uh, to enable it. I think, I think that would help, but I'm not sure that they are incentivized to do that because that's one more thing that makes you know the account perhaps more difficult to use to some users and might be frustrating to some people uh, but I think if they as long as they're left the choice to opt out I would like to see something like that yeah that that would make sense I think uh, one problem here uh, the implementers have and I ran into this myself uh, when I implemented like on the storm center website we offer it you know, as an opt-in part uh, how do you actually reset a lost two-factor? Uh, how do you sort of reset that second two-factor? You, know, you, you now have, again, that password reset challenge, and uh, I haven't really seen a great solution for that uh, that would scale, like in particular for these free accounts like Gmail and such. Yes, that is a problem because you are still only as strong as your weakest link. And so if people only use you know password security questions that are easily something that people can find out you know through open source research then then you are still um, you know still quite vulnerable um, maybe you know second just a second form well really I guess a third form as a backup is hmm. is one decent option um, but yeah that that is a problem with the technology uh, I think another thing that uh, and slightly reverting back to your previous question here as well is uh, the easier to use versions of this. I think the new uh, notification based implementations such as uh, Google Prompt or Microsoft Authenticator has it as well where rather than asking the user to type in another code they're just they have a push based implementation where they're just having to tap approve. I think once users see that type of implementation and how easy to use it is, I think they will become more confident. But I, I'm still not sure that those types of implementations will get users over the hump in deciding to use it in the first place. And that's something I am looking to uh, possibly look into for future research is if you know a similar video to the one we used in, in this survey demonstrates the easier to use forms of technology will that uh, will that help some more users a higher percentage of them adopt and I, I don't know the answer to that yeah now one thing I've seen I forgot who did it uh, was it Yahoo Microsoft Google one of the big three there uh, what they actually went to is they basically removed the password part so if you're using the application either with the push based or the one-time code for authentication, uh, then you no longer need a password. Uh, do you think uh, that would be actually better than what we have now, which is only a password? Yes, I do think that would be better than only a password. Of course, both is even better because it's you know the something you have and something you know sort of scenario with. Um, you know, the password being the thing that you know, and then the second factor typically being derived from something you have with your phone. Uh, and, and, you know, I should also point out that these implementations, uh, some of them are kind of, 
you know, there are two step verification. There's slightly different names and, in fact, slightly different technologies involved in these. Um, but I just, I like to point that out if I refer to all of them sort of as multi factor in this context. You know, to me, they're more or less interchangeable when we're having a broad discussion about why don't people use these across all of these different providers. Uh, I just wanted to point out, I know some of your listeners probably appreciate the subtleties in these different implementations. Right. Yeah. Now, you already hinted a little bit uh, at it, uh, but uh, what's next? I know where you want to take this uh, from here. Well, yes. So the first study focused specifically on millennials, which I think is a very good group to study because, you know, they're, uh, they sort of have this innate, you know, capability with technology and they're heavy users of all of these types of applications that we talk about and uh, and they're going to be entering the workplace uh, in, within the next few years, most of them. So I think they're an important group to study, especially as you, you start seeing people's security behaviors in their personal accounts impact the business. Um, but that's one opportunity is to actually study how these things work with different demographics. So, for example, I mentioned the user self-efficacy being so important. Well, there's a good chance that that was even much higher for the group that I studied than the rest of the population at large. You know, so. Uh, what are the impacts of that? That would be one area. And then as I mentioned, and I think this is what I would focus on more next, I want to see if demonstrating easier to use technologies than the uh, SMS-based implementation will help with adoption. I kind of think that it will not because SMS is something that everybody is comfortable with. Now, in reality, and I guess, you know, I shouldn't just assert this because maybe it's it's my opinion but to me the push notification based implementation is much easier to use because you're just talking about a tap not having to look at one device and then go type in another code on another device you're just you know maybe a swipe and a tap or a tap and you're in I, I think it's definitely much quicker and that's something I, I can show um, you know, with data if I uh, proceed with a study like that. But so will that help users ahead of time on the front end to adopt? That's a question. And then those who do, um, you can compare how they like the different implementations. And then you can also cons compare the speeds of them to see which one is in fact faster. Well, uh, that's a great, Preston. Thanks uh, for taking the time here uh, to uh, talk to me about your paper. For anybody who is interested in more details, uh, you can find the paper in the research section of the sans.edu website. That's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.